and there's a lot of research, and a lot of that was done with the yeast seleniums. Uh -huh. um, so when they first came out, there's a lot of research back then that looked at yeast seleniums in the inorganics and found out that you could feed less yeast selenium and it had better bio bioavailability. So the animal could use it, absorb it, and use it more efficiently than it can the inorganics. Hello, welcome back to the Dairy Podcast Show. My name is Barry Bradford from Michigan State University. Today, I'm very pleased to welcome Dr. Nancy Whitehouse to the show. Dr. Whitehouse is a, a assistant research professor at the University of New Hampshire and um, has uh, worked there for many years doing lots of uh, research on rumen availability and uh, general ruminant nutrition. So Dr. Whitehouse, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you for having me. I always like to ask people how they ended up in this spot. So you're the scientist working with dairy cattle. Um, what got you into this in the first place? Well, I grew up on a dairy farm in New York. Um, when I was 10 or 11, my parents sold the dairy cows, but I worked on neighbor's farms. Okay. But my really, my first love was horses and I worked in an equine clinic and I didn't get into Cornell for the vet school pre-vet and they told me to go to UNH. So I came up here and started working. I worked on the research farm. Um, many of you might know Dr. Holter. I worked for him and Dr. Schwab. Yep. And I decided I didn't wasn't hundred percent sure if I wanted to do vet school anymore. So I went and worked in a small animal clinic and found out that was not what I wanted to do. <laughs> okay. um, so then I was talking to Dr. Schwab and he had, you know, he had a lot of undergrads. So I started working in his lab as an undergrad. And then when I graduated, he hired me as a technician and then it just progressed from there. Um, Two years into after I graduated, he said, well, what about a master's? And I said, yeah, sure, fine. <laughs> <laughs> at, um, at the time, my husband is the manager of the dairy, so it didn't make sense for us to try to go somewhere else looking for a master's. So I gotcha. stayed here. 20 years later, I decided I wanted a PhD um, and got that under Dr. Brito, who's a, one of the new faculty. Well, not new now, but new at the time. Yep. And then once I got the PhD, the department said, well, how about becoming a research faculty? And I said, why not? <laughs> <laughs> and that's how I landed where I am. And a lot of it is a lot of credit goes to Dr. Schwab because he kept pushing me to keep going further and further. That's fantastic. Adiseo, a global leader in nutritional solutions and the provider of Smart Amine M the best in-class rumen-protected methionine product for dairy producers who want to optimize milk production, capture more value from their components, and maintain the lifetime performance of their herds. For more product information and to calculate your return on investment when you balance your feed with amino acids, go to MilkPay.com. So I, I, on paper, I guess then your job is 100% research. So you work with a lot of different companies and uh, working with graduate students, I assume? No, actually, all my work is with undergrads. Okay. So, yep. you know, I was given that chance as an undergrad to get into research. So I try to do that with a lot of undergrads. I have anywhere from 10 to 20 undergrads working for me. Wow. Which might seem like a lot. And sometimes it is like herding cats. <laughs> um, but it's fun to see. I've had a couple of them go on. Um, if any of you know Heather Tucker, she worked for me and she's now out in industry after getting a PhD and master's at other places. So it's really rewarding to see that kind of coming about, you know, and passing things on. Um, I will be taking on a master's student this year, but most of the time it's undergrads. I guess in higher ed lingo, that's one of a handful of high impact practices, right? That that really can be transformational for a student during their undergraduate years. So that's terrific that you can give so many students that opportunity. Excellent. Well, uh, one thing uh, we thought we could talk about today is selenium, which is a super interesting nutrient. Um, but just to make sure we, you know, don't jump ahead and, and, and leave anybody behind, let's just start out talking about what is selenium in the first place. Okay. So for those of you 
who don't haven't taken nutrition course, courses and learned vitamins and minerals. Selenium is a mineral. And there's a lot of places that are selenium deficient in that mineral. I happen to live in one of those areas. Um, so we have to supplement cows with selenium in order that our calves, when they're born, do not have white muscle disease. And if anybody doesn't know what that is, a calf is born, it can't stand up. The muscles haven't, you need that selenium for that muscle development. So some places will feed selenium. Some places will give selenium shots. It just all depends on what you want to do. Um, there's different types of selenium, and that's what people don't always realize. We have organic and inorganic seleniums. Most people feed the inorganic because it's cheaper. Mm -hmm. But there is research out there and some of the work I've done here that shows that the in the organic ones are absorbed better and can do what they have to do. And a lot of it has to deal with um, just immune function in cows, okay, to help just keep their immune function up and running. And it's the same. It's true for humans, too. So if you live in a selenium deficient area for a human, you also need that selenium. And when you say selenium deficient area, what do you mean? The selenium is deficient in the soil, so the plants do not absorb it. So therefore, it can't be transferred from the plant to the animal or plant to human. Okay, good. So what are, you mentioned there's um, inorganic and organic forms of that. So if, if I was going to look at a label, what, what would the inorganic form typically be? Oh, now you're asking me a question. I didn't really see. I, I'm sorry. I think I, in my mind it's sodium selenite, but I don't know if that's the only option. That's usually what I think of. There is another one. Oh, I you're can't right. Remember what it is? But the sodium selenite is the one that most people feed. Yeah. Okay. Um, because I think it's the cheapest one out there for yep. the or inorganic ones. The organic one, most people are going to be feeding a yeast selenium of some kind. Okay. Um, and now you have the hydroxy selenium methionine on the market. Um, that was the work I did. Um, I did an FDA trial to help Adiseo get that to the marketplace. This, this is a selenium that's incorporated into methionine and then there's a hy hydroxy modification. Is that basically what it looks like? If anybody has ever dealt with their Adiseo's HMBI, hydroxy methionine, oh, tertiary butyric something, Propolis, <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah, it's like a big long name. So what they did instead of putting um, the isopropyl on it, they put the the selenium on it. And my uh, so they put a selenium on it. So when you feed this, not only do you get selenium, but you will get a little bit of methionine with it. Yeah, that makes sense. But yeah, it's basically that it's the HMBI technology, but with selenium instead of um, the isopropyl. Okay. That probably helps helps it make sense to a lot of people. Um, and so the the logic here is that you can feed less than you would of the inorganic, or you can get more available, or both. It's both. You can feed a little bit less of these organic products than you can inorganic. And there's a lot of research, and a lot of that was done with the yeast seleniums. Uh huh. Um, so when they first came out, there's a lot of research back then that looked at yeast seleniums in the inorganics and found out that you could feed less yeast selenium and it had better bio bioavailability. So the animal could use it, absorb it, and use it more efficiently than it can the inorganics. Um, so what we did, what I did, and a bunch of students, um, we looked at this um, hydroxy selenium with ionine and found out that that's even better than the yeast selenium. Mm. So you can feed a little bit less um, and you still get the same benefit. Okay. And the amounts we fed were still within. So we fed a little bit more than what you would feed because it's research. We always do weird things in research. Right. Not like that, but we were pushing those upper levels. People don't realize that there is a max amount that you can feed of selenium put out by the FDA so we were pushing that upper level just in case people do that. Um, but we found out that even not even having to go to that upper level, that the selenium methionine was a better than the selenium. Okay. So what exactly was the data that, that led to that? Are you actually measuring digestibility by collecting fecal samples? Or are you looking at blood, blood levels? Or 
we looked at blood and milk. So we okay. wanted to know if you fed this selenium, was it transferred to the blood? And from the blood, was it transferred to the milk? And yes, it is transferred to the blood and it is transferred to the milk. Um, and so the amounts we fed for the selenium with ionine were zero, one milligram, 0.1 milligram, 0.3 milligrams. And we did have a linear increase in milk and plasma at those levels. Okay. For the yeast selenium, we just fed one level. And yeah, gotcha. All right. So what, what does that study look like? If these are mid-lactation cows. What, what kind of numbers did you use? These were mid-lactation cows and we had 24 cows on trial. So we had uh, six cows for each treatment. So we had a control, which was just no added selenium. It was ever whatever selenium is found in the feeds. Yep. And we did the 0.1 of the selenium, 0.1 of the siliciomethionine, and 0.3 milligrams, sorry, um, of the siliciomethionine. Um, the cows were on trial. We had a covariate period, so we knew what was going on before we ever tried. And then it was, they were on for, I think it was 10 weeks. That one, 91 days. Okay. Yeah, quite a while. Yeah, it was quite a while. Um, during that time, we not only did feed intake and blood samples and milk samples, but um, I had students, especially pre-vet students, love this. You go down, you make them take heart rates and respiration rates and oh. how, may, how many times are the cows chewing their cud and all that stuff. So they were down there at various times throughout the day. I even had kids in here at 2 o'clock at night um, doing this kind of stuff just so we could see, did it make any differences in the, in that kind of health? And there was no differences. So that was not, but it was something that we did do. Um, and then with the blood, we sent it off and had all kinds of blood chemistry done on it. And there was, there was a difference between the control cows and the, and the yeast cows, but there was no difference between the selenium with ionine and the the selenium with ionine and the yeast cows were not different than they were different from the control cows. Okay. So we found out by feeding the selenium, we did decrease certain things and increase other things. And don't ask me what all of them were. Yeah. Uh, but basically, overall, we significantly didn't, it was not significant, the improvements in health, but there were trends okay. to improve the health of the animal by having the selenium. Based on blood markers, yeah. Based okay. on blood markers. So it's kind of interesting to me that you were um, measuring things like heart rate and you know other physiological indicators, which is not typically what we think about first with a nutrition study with, with adding you know some micronutrient to the diet. Was that a component of this being an FDA uh, approval study? Yes, it was. If you've never run an FDA trial before, they ask you for things that you're just scratching your head about. So we had to take keep track of the temperature in the barn and, you know, heart rates. And we had to, I mean, the kids were even doing physical look at urine samples and fecal samples. Were they changing colors? And that's real fun too. Um, so there were a lot of things going on that as a nutritionist, I would not think of doing. Uh -huh. But because it's an FDA trial and they want to make sure all the bases are covered, you do it and everything has to be initialed and you send all this stuff into them. And I also have to keep this stuff for like seven or eight years before I can toss it. So there's a lot that goes into these. And I mean, it took a year from when Adesayo first, oh, two years from when Adesayo first approached me to when we got the trial running, because there's so many things you have to answer with the FDA. Um, the barn staff had to think differently mm about how they were handling the animals. I mean, we had to, if most of these cows were pregnant at the time, but if they weren't and they were breeding them, we had to know everything that dealt with that. Mm. If it was a call cow, why was she a call cow? Was she a call cow before I put her on trial or was she a call cow after she, you know, it was just a whole bunch of things that you don't think of when you're just running a nutrition trial. But because of FDA, you have to do all this fun stuff. Yeah, I think it's it's not bad for people to understand kind of what what goes into that, right? Because it's it's a little three little three little letters on a package, but right. <laughs> there's a lot behind that, right? Yeah, and then the report you have to write up afterward. You know, if 
when you're writing up, like when I write up reports for companies after I've done a trial, you know, it might be 10 pages. Yep. This thing was 50 pages by the time we were said and done. You know, everything that had to, you know, if a cow was sick, why was she sick? You know, everything had to be documented. Um, the other thing I had to do is the vet, the vet, te- the veterinarian, our animal care and use vet had to come in before the trial, halfway through the trial and at the end of the trial and do a total health assessment of these cows. It was like, oh. <laughs> all that had to be, you know, summarized and sent off to the FDA. So it's not as I, when I first th- started looking to it's like, oh, it's just another trial. No, it's like five trials put into one. <laughs> so it's a lot of work. Um, and when you're working with students, you, you kind of have to be on top of them all the time to make sure that they're doing things yeah. correctly. And they're signing, you know, when they were down doing heart rates and all that, they had to sign their names and all kinds of things. So. Yeah, it's a lot to keep track of. And basically all that's because, correct me if I'm off here, but basically the way I think about it is there's three three things FDA has to assess. One is, is the product claim actually validated, right? Are you actually seeing a change in blood and milk selenium? Yeah. Two, is there any evidence that it's harming the health or welfare of the animal? And then three, I don't know if this was part of your study or not, but at least with some products, they have to assess risks to uh, humans consuming food as well. Yeah, we had, to, we had to do that. So with our milk samples, not only did we measure selenium, but um, they were, you know, it was the normal stuff we measure. And then we had to send them off for selenium content. And we We had to make sure that we were not, I never realized, but there is a threshold of selenium in milk and meat. And we had to make sure that we didn't bypass that. Um, And then they thought about doing um, doing biopsies, muscle biopsies at the end to see if there was selenium in the muscle. But um, because we didn't get a, as high an increase in milk as we thought we were going to get, Mm. The FDA said, no, don't bother with the muscle biopsies. I and see. We, it was in our proposal, but they came back and said, don't bother. Gotcha. Um, and it's not like you submit a report at the very end. You know, they're they're contacting you throughout your trial saying, okay, what's going on? Yeah. <laughs> you have a new friend for 91 yeah. days. <laughs> yeah. And so, you know, you, you've got to also always have your data. So if they contact you, you can say, okay, well, this is what we're seeing so far. You know, um, yep. it's not like, okay, you do it 91 days later, write a report. No, they they contacted me a couple of times throughout the trial to find out how things are going. They never came. I was always afraid they were going to come because other people had run FDA trials said, oh, yeah, they just periodically show up. And I'm like, oh. <laughs> they never did. So I got lucky there. But it was right before COVID, so I think some of that was going on, too. Gotcha. Yeah, that makes sense. So I got lucky there. (laughs) Natural Biologics is using cutting-edge science to deliver cost-effective solutions for the animal health and productivity challenges you face. For conventional or organic production systems, Natural Biologics can help support rumen health and immune function, mitigate pathogens, and increase production efficiency. Visit naturalbiologics.com to learn more. Well, okay. So you published um, this work. It came out last year. Um, obviously, you put a lot of time into this and such. Um, for, for nutritionists out there or producers that are curious about this, um, how, how do you see this this fitting in um, to a nutrition program? I mean, are, is the advice that you meet half your selenium requirement with an inorganic and then you top it up with this? Or do you have advice for people on on the, the approach to these different products? Not really, but I always feel if you can get an organic version, which mm-hmm. you know is absorbed easier, that's what I would go with. I would skip the inorganics. Um, mm-hmm. They're just not absorbed as easily, and the cow doesn't use them as well. Um, you know, and it's not just cows, it's also pigs and chickens and things like that. And yep. I know, like with the with chickens, they've kind of gotten away from the in organics, they're pretty much now fully focusing on organics. And I think that's the way the dairy industry needs to go too, whether it's this yeast, you know, yeast selenium or it's this, you know, selenium with ionine. It's just, it's, you can feed less of it and you get a better result. Um, and I think 
especially with the yeast seleniums, they're not super expensive. I don't know about the seleniomethionine. I don't know what Adiseo is pricing that at. Gotcha. But if you can feed a lot less of it and you get more benefit at the other end, I think it's worth it. And I, I think you made a good point a few minutes ago that selenium is a little bit unique where other trace minerals, you could just feed more of a poorly absorbed version, whereas there's a flat out legal limit to how much selenium you can put in the diet because of the risk of right. you know, potential toxicity to humans of too much in milk or meat, right? So it's a different scenario. You cannot over, you can't say, oh, well, let's just add another pound to our new. No. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you can't do that. They will come after you. <laughs> right. That's a big no-no. <laughs> yeah. So to get a, you know, to get something that's going to be a little bit better bioavailability and you can feed less of it and be a little more within those guidelines, I think is a better way to go. Makes sense. So real quick, any, any uh, sneak peeks into what you're focusing on right now, or, or is there some uh, s- stuff you're going to share at the summer meetings this year? Well, most of my research is with amino acids Yep. or Dr. Schwab, you know. Um, so I'm kind of continuing the work he started here at UNH. Um, so yeah, I do have two papers, um, dealing with bioavailability, one with lysine, um, okay. the new Chemin product, and then the new milk specialties, methionine product. I'll be sharing that data. And then with Dr. Lalu Balu from Adiseo, we did some, um, meta-analysis on I've collected way too many papers and looked at things, but it was looking at milk and plasma, amino, like basically methionine, and they focused in on just the smart amine papers. But okay. eventually we're going to take this and bring in the MEPROM papers and some of the other papers and start looking at that. But we had to, we had to make start somewhere and now we're going to be expanding. Um, so there is that kind of stuff coming up. Um, and then I, have done some work with mycotoxins and I hope to be publishing that paper sometime this year. Fantastic. Well, it sounds like some good stuff coming. I'll definitely keep my eyes open (laughs) for those. I don't think we're going to do any more with the selenium paper um, just because we didn't really see significances in the blood work. I don't think we're going to, um, they haven't asked me to do anything more with that. So I think this is where they are going to finish this up. It's time for our famous three. Introducing Ultrasorb R3.0, Volac's comprehensive and complete solution to reduce the negative impact of naturally occurring toxins on ruminants. Ultrasorb R3.0 is a species-specific product designed to mitigate the effects of specific mycotoxins in the gastrointestinal tract of ruminants. Ultrasorb R3.0 also offers lipopolysaccharides binding capabilities. Endotoxins such as LPS can contribute to inflammation in ruminants with energy partitioned to mount an immune response instead of production. Learn more about Ultrasorb R3.0 at volac.com. Okay, well, there's three questions that we throw at everybody. Uh, looking forward to see uh, where you come out on these. Uh, the first one we always ask is, what's your favorite dairy-related book or resource? Mine is uh, the Ruminant Nutrition, the Ruminant Animal by Churchill. Um, it's like the book everybody reads many years ago when you were an undergrad and grad student, but it's got a lot of good information in it. Um, so I still like that book, even though some of it might not be as relevant as it should be. But it's a good it's a good resource book to have. Good one to pull off the shelf when somebody calls you about selenium and you haven't thought about it in ten years, right? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> or you know, some of the other minerals or vitamins that you know go, oh, okay. <laughs> so you know, it's just a good resource book. All right. What about your favorite book or resource outside of ag? There's a lot of those. Um, I read it 40 years ago and I just bought it again to read again. And it's called the talisman and it's a Stephen King, Peter Strobe book. Um, It's kind of like all those fantasy books, but it's a fun book just to kind of read and kind of forget about everything. Um, You know, leave work where work is and just go into a fantasy land. Absolutely. So it's just kind of a fun book and it's fun to reread it. You know, I read it when it first came out. So it's been kind of fun rereading it and just going, Oh, I forgot about that part. Yeah. It's interesting what you remember and what you don't. When, you yeah. Know. And, it, but it's a long book. It's a over a thousand pages. So 
it's my summer read book. Worth 20 bucks then, huh? <laughs> you get a lot yeah. for your money. <laughs> <laughs> okay, put that on the list. And then uh, last question, in your opinion, what sets successful dairy professionals apart from those who are less successful? Depends on where you're talking about. If you're talking about research, the successful research, dairy researchers, I think are the ones that are hardworking um, and they're, they're not willing, they're willing to go down in the barn and get their hands dirty if they have mm. to. Um, so they know what's going on in the barn with the animals. You're not like going, oh, well, a grad student will tell me or an undergrad will tell me. Um, when I'm running research, I'm down in the barn every day, sometimes a couple of times a day, just to keep a handle on things. And I've seen researchers that do that and they usually have a really good program and they have good research. And I've seen researchers where they're kind of hands off and things don't go as well as I think they should. Um, for a nutritionist, same thing. The nutritionist that's out in the field going on to the farms, you know, not just talking to the, to the farmer, but talking, you know, actually getting out with the cows and seeing what's going on. I think they, they're a better nutritionist than the guy that kind of relies on the farmer. Yes, you need input from the farmer, but you also need to get out and see those cows yourself. Good answer. The cows don't lie, right? That's what I was always taught. That's what I've been told ever since I started research. Cows don't lie. <laughs> uh, well, Nancy, I've enjoyed the conversation. Thanks so much for being a part of this today. Thank you for having me. Again, we've had a conversation today with Dr. Nancy Whitehouse from the University of New Hampshire. This has been another episode of the Dairy Podcast Show. And if you haven't subscribed yet, don't forget to hit that button. And we will see you next time.